Good morning from my side too. I am surprised to see so many of you at this point of the day. Um, well, all the better for us and for journal history. Um, I think we will try to uh, do it as conversational as possible to get a smooth start into the Sunday, but we will nonetheless uh, have a small input from us, from the panel, and then maybe uh, engage with you because I know that there are uh, at least 40 journal histories present in this room, so it would be good to, to have that uh, as an integral part of our conversation. Um, this morning with me on the panel are uh, Marit Kapla, uh, the editor, uh, one of the editors of uh, Udit Bild, um, a very old and well-known cultural journal, not only in Sweden, but also within Eurozine, because it has been one of the founding journals of the European, of the Eurozine network. Uh, then we have Sally Davison, uh, editor of the British journal Soundings, um, very interesting uh, intellectual history of this journal uh, here as well. We will hear a bit more on that very soon. Um, I um, go to Waldemar Kuligowski on your very right. Um, he is the editor of Czas Kulturi, pardon my Polish. Um, <laughs> a Polish, um, uh, I think you can say left-wing uh, cultural journal, also linked to dissident uh, history in, in Poland. And um, Waldemar contributed, like everybody else on the panel, um, to, to the focal point uh, we have set up. And if I say we, I mean um, the um, working group with the unpronounceable German name you've heard, or most of you have heard about uh, already on Friday, uh, a working group on um, uh, periodical studies, uh, which I represent, but uh, which also Morten Paul um, uh, here also on the panel represents. Uh, Morten is a fellow historian with a specialization in uh, publishing history and uh, intellectual history. And he will give us uh, a little bit more of a um, uh, maybe a theoretical uh, or historical uh, input on, on journal history later on. Um, from my side, uh, oh, and he's also the editor uh, and uh, one of the two authors with uh, Morten, uh, with um, uh, Moritz Neufer, who's here in the audience as well, of an article which uh, has been published this morning um, on the Eurozine website uh, on the journals of the far right and uh, the publishing universe of the uh, conservative revolution. <laughs> which um, for understandable and good reasons isn't so present in the audience, but I think we shouldn't uh, uh, forget that um, the um, history of um, cultural journals is not only a journal of the liberal or the left, but there's also a, a whole universe of uh, uh, conservative uh, or even far-right um, cultural journals that have been around for a long time. So if you want to know more about that, um, please do check the website once you have an internet connection again. <laughs> um, from my side, um, I would just propose to all of you on the panel and also in the audience something like a, a light motif under which we could think of uh, um, journal history. I would like uh, to propose that we suggest cultural journals as uh, actors in their own right. Um, so as active uh, protagonists of intellectual history and not only as it has been um, uh, conceived for a long time, especially in research, as uh, somehow a medium that reflects a certain kind of thinking or that uh, carries texts or, or discourses or th theories, um, but rather as uh, an actor that shapes journals, uh, shapes theories in, in, a, in several regards, in aesthetic regard, in ideological, in sociological regards. So um, I would like to invite just everybody contributing also to this panel to look at your journal in this regard, for example, what does a journal do to theory or with theory? 
how does it interact with the cultural, political, intellectual community, um, what is the mode of intervention in the public sphere, what is specific about this, and how did this change over time. Um, yeah, and so one, one important question here is the journal form. Um, obviously, journals have a very specific <coughs> form. Um, we've seen yesterday it's not so easy to uh, pinpoint what a cultural journal actually is, but if we approach it from a historical uh, perspective, we can maybe see that the journal form has been historically linked to a certain idea of enlightenment deliberation, um, a certain quest that is linked to the essay as a, as a genre. It has a certain aesthetics that has a lot to do, at least in 20th century, with the modernist avant-garde movements. If you think of how um, journals uh, uh, work with collage techniques and something else, so one idea could be uh, to, to ask ourselves what this journal form um, is today. Could it also be assumed by a blog, by a radio station, a spoken word journal? Um, you know, th these kinds of interrogations maybe as, as, as an input um, to meditate uh, while you listen now to three specific inputs and specific histories of, of cultural journals. And uh, we will start with uh, Marit and uh, Odet Bild. All right. Uh, yeah, um, I hope you can hear me. Um, so I, I wanted to, there, there's a lot to say when you, um, uh, um, you know, have the fortune to be an ed one of the editors. I'm the editor together with Anne Ige. And um, uh, of a journal who was founded in 1892. So there's a lot to say, but I just want to give some like visual examples of how we work with our heritage and legacy uh, of order build. And in this first image, you can see what it looks like in our office. It's uh, a cupboard that was ordered by our founder, Carl Wolin, around the year of 1900 to store the issues in. Uh, and so these are the, um, the issues from uh, 1892 and onwards. Uh, and there are more if you would have you know, made a panorama around the room. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it's called Ord and Build. And that was because the techniques for printing images, uh, it means words and image. And the technique for printing images in a more cheap way to reproduce them uh, was new at that time. So it was um, like an innovation to, to have lots of images um, in a journal like this. And Carl Wolin, he was an art historian. He was working in the National Museum of Art. And first, uh, in the very beginning, it, the, the journal was attached to a publishing house, but soon uh, I think they, uh, um, th they came to differ. <laughs> in I think the publishing house wanted an impact uh, on the content more than Carl Wolin wanted to give them. So uh, he broke out and, and funded uh, on his own. He, he fi found other um, financers. Um, so, sorry. Uh, and ever since, it's been like an independent uh, foundation, Stiftung, Stiftelse. So, and um, it still is. With the, the main asset is the <laughs> this cupboard <laughs> and the, all the, the issues. So, um, and then, um, so, um, and uh, yeah, so when, when we, we celebrated our um, 125th anniversary last year, and so this is the anniversary issue. And when you work uh, at Order Build, you know, there have been made, uh, published a lot of anniversary <laughs> issues before. This is the 100 uh, <laughs> anniversary issue, for example. So, so what do you do? And we write in our, Anne and me, we, we write in our um, uh, editorial introduction. It's like standing on the shoulder of giants. <laughs> and, uh, um, so what do you do? And then we uh, decided to, uh, because the history of the journal has been written before, so we, we asked, so let me see now, we asked um, 
a number of uh, writers to write. Uh, they they had like a free um, option. They they could write anything they wanted about one decade in the history of the journal. So um, um, and then we also included um, some archive texts. This is one of them. Um, it's uh, written by um, a pioneer. Um, activist for a uh, female right to vote, um, but yeah, so this is the original, but uh, well, so we include, um, and we also included a translated poem poem from the 60s by Sylvia Plath, so we, um, that's how we did the anniversary issue. And another thing that we do is that we uh, try to digitalize um, text from our archive. The, it was an interesting discussion about archives yesterday in, in the bar camp and uh, I think that's uh, a very important part of um, uh, I mean what the cultural journal is and it's very uh, it, it's very um, rewarding to work with that uh, and so what we do with this we call it like digital anniversary library number one two and uh, uh, more are to follow, but uh, then we ask one person to write an essay about a specific theme, in this case um, fascism, uh, old and new fasci fascism, um, and then this person curates like a selection of archive texts and, and we ask for rights and we digitalize them. Um, so, um, and this is uh, another one uh, about the anniversary actually, but, but we also have um, uh, there's a great thing about order build. It's included in in um, a project that is called Project Runeberg. Uh, it was founded, I think, it came out of Linköping's University, one of the universities in Sweden. Um, and so they have digitalized, scanned, and digitalized uh, every year uh, from 1892 until 1947. So um, those text you can read online already. So we are mainly working when with the undigitalized, so far undigitalized uh, uh, um, years. And just one last slide. Uh, well, just how to, this summer, um, I, I myself, I, wa I walked, <laughs> I made a walk in a part of Sweden um, that Ellen Kay, who is, uh, this is, Ellen Kay, she was a, a writer, um, um, also, well, uh, she, she wrote a text in order building in the, um, published in um, 1900, where she, uh, in her turn, she walked in the footsteps of a novel of by Selma Lagerlöf, so, and then, um, so I wrote about them uh, and the text on Instagram, so we, and then the, it will become a text published in next issue of order build, so, you can, uh, you can like, it was very fun to pl play with like an archive um, text like that. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I think uh, it's uh, useful if we have the presentations first and then one have uh, a common round of, of dis uh, questions and discussions here on the panel and then maybe uh, give it to, to the audience. Uh, I already have, uh, at least one question on, on, on the archive, because I think indeed this is a, a very important cue on, on uh, how to define uh, and also the function of, of cultural journals. But uh, for now, let's, uh, let's give it uh, to, to Sally and to, to Soundings for, for quite a different uh, project, I, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to talk particularly about Soundings as being one strand in a particular intellectual current, because when we were talking yesterday, that seemed to be the thing that people were interested in. So Soundings was founded only 20, just over 20 years ago, in 1995, by um, Stuart Hall, who I think many of you will know, and Doreen Massey, who I hope also many of you know, perhaps not so well known, but still quite well known in Britain, Michael Ruston. And um, it was uh, set up as um, a left journal, but very particularly as part of um, uh, the new left tradition, which I think varies from country to country, but um, in Britain it has a very particular history, which is strongly associated with um, Stuart Hall, and also um, the idea of the central, the centrality of culture to politics. 
So um, I'm going to talk not just about soundings, but I'm going to go back a bit further into history. Not too far. Um, so um, New Left Review, Stuart Hall was the first editor of, which a lot of people don't realise. Um, th the way that started was um, in 1956, um, which we all know the significance of that year, I think. Um, and uh, so there was an existing independent left journal, which was called the Oxford, um, the Oxford University Review, which was, um, it was trying to find a space, basically, between social democracy and communism. So trying to find an alternative left space. That's where the idea of new left in Britain, certainly, anyway, came from. And so um, what happened was there was an amalgamation of dissident communists of whom, again, you'll probably know Edward Thompson um, as being probably the most well-known one outside of Britain anyway. Um, and so they came together with this independent left journal to form the New Left Review. And I think what's also interesting about that is that it, when I, I was been reading because of doing this talk about Stuart Hall talking about the history of the New Left, and he talks about generations, so the generational preoccupations of his generation which was the younger generation at that time, were very much about post-war capitalism and trying to get a handle on um, the cultural, you know, trying to understand capitalism culturally, which was a kind of a, a new thing at that time. Whereas the <coughs> dissident communists were actually people who tended to have been formed before the Second World War. So they were coming from like a popular front, anti-fascist um, history. So they, their different generations had different preoccupations, but that kind of um, dialogue they had together produced something new. And I'm quite interested in talking about how ideas pass from generation to generation, because there's obviously a, a sense in which there's a body of ideas that do get passed on, but obviously each generational cohort has its own, own preoccupations. So it's like, how do those ideas get passed on? And the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I would say that we try and think of our journal, or I do anyway, uh, as it's, it's like, it, when we had the discussion in the bar camp yesterday, people were talking about whether you defined your readers as supporters and friends, or whether just simply people who wanted to come and read your journal, and there it was. And I think our end of cultural journals is very much people who share a set of ideas and want to participate in a particular set of conversations but I also found it interesting, the idea that we talked about yesterday, that if you make it too much like that, then you can be quite an exclusive group. So it's how you have that idea of a conversation that has certain preoccupations, but is also an open conversation. So just a, a couple more points, because I realise we haven't much time. So um, in terms of journals, so uh, the New Left Review, which uh, some of you may know today, is a very different journal now from what it was when it first started, when Stuart was the editor. Um, and it's much more theoretical Marxist international journal now, which is part of the New Left tradition, but it's like one part of it. And I would say that Stuart's part is more interesting. So he then went off and thought a lot about culture and politics. And again, many of you, will, I think, know about the Birmingham Centre of Contemporary Cultural Studies and the whole, that's partly Richard Hoggart, but also centrally Stuart, um, uh, were thinking about culture and sort of inventing the discipline of cultural studies, which um, in its British initial <coughs> stages was very much a political project. So although it was about culture, it was thinking about culture in relation to politics. And for, so for example, um, when people talk about identity, cultural politics has to talk about people's identities. That's part of political life. So, um, so, but Stuart didn't write very much. Well, they wrote books. They wrote two very important books, which was The Empire Strikes Back and um, Policing the Crisis. And they were, all, they were collaborative books that were multi-authored, um, um, kind of a different way of working. Anyway, um, and then just out of interest, so there was another journal uh, in the late 80s, early um, 90s, well, no, mainly in the 80s, Marxism Today, which was actually a Marxist communist journal, but for Stuart, it, you know, so this is the thing about you don't totally identi identify with the place where you write. So it was a place where he could write because there weren't other intellectual left journals, but clearly he didn't completely identify with that, but he could find that as a forum where he could write. So he wrote a lot of articles in Marxism Today, um, and in particular he wrote an article about Thatcherism where he invented the term, or you know, coined the term Thatcherism, 
which for us in Britain anyway, then evolved to mean, to come to, we realised it was a more widespread phenomenon. So we, it, we then started talking about it as neoliberalism, you know. So that's been a very strong current within our journal. Um, and so Stuart wrote there, and then that ended. And then so uh, there was, in 1995, when Tony Blair had been leader of the Labour Party for a couple of years, but not in government, and pe a lot of people were very concerned <laughs> about what he might do to the Labour Party, and we were clearly right. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so it started then to try, and it's called soundings, because it was the idea of soundings of different sets of ideas. You know, where are the ideas that we now need to renew the left? Um, and so that's why we were set up. And then, finally, it's my final point. So, and now today, we're trying to think, because they get, in Britain there is now an upsurge again in the left, and of young people who are interested in these ideas. So we're now thinking again, because we are, tend to be older people, you know, Adam is younger. But um, we're older people, but so trying to think about how we can now share that and pass on that kind of current of ideas, which doesn't belong to us, but which we've got a role in kind of curating and passing on. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. Just um, the words I've heard so far, the archive, the role of generation of passing on, um, the role of collaborative writing, Stuart Hall being one who has paradigmatically worked in collaborations and maybe not through big books uh, out there every three years. So that seems something specific about a certain form of cultural journal as well. Um, the idea of um, a journal as a place to share ideas uh, versus a place uh, that puts out texts uh, for something, uh, for, for, for a maximum of readership. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for, for this um, contribution. We will continue with uh, Waldemar and um, uh, just Kulturi, and uh, also just for you to know, Waldemar has also uh, contributed a very good article to our focal point on the history of cultural journals in Poland and um, the link between the political history, um, uh, the neoliberal turn in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and what it did to the, cu to the scene of cultural journal. Um, so, just uh, as, a, as a hint for good read on the way back uh, to wherever you live. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Czas Kultury, or Time of Culture, is a Polish quarterly magazine uh, published since 85. Uh, at the very beginning, it was exactly Zine, not only, not yet Euro, Euro, but, but Zine with uh, small format, handmade, uh, white and uh, black color, like Samizdat, I think. It was published uh, out of censorship, out of control, out of uh, official circulation. Now, of course, uh, our magazine has changed over this uh, relatively long, relatively long uh, period. Uh, first, it was uh, political and social magazine, then literary and, uh, and artistic. And now, Czas Kultury is a hybrid form of artistic and uh, academic period. Why we, why we have chosen this, this form? Because, because our readers are different. There are those who remember old Czas Kultury in uh, literary style, uh, there are those who uh, want to read only academic articles, and there are those who want to read both academic and, uh, and artistic uh, content. <laughs> Hybrid form. Uh, each issue uh, includes cover story. Cover story is a set of uh, academic articles with all academic rigors like uh, uh, double blind reviews. Uh, this year we prepared cover story in topics like uh, education for a peace, like uh, repatriotism or uh, 68 uh, counterculture. Each issue includes also uh, poems, literature, interviews, essays, I think that is uh, briefly 
history. Yes, of course, many details. Many details is in uh, for for speak. Uh, we prepare special number for uh, 100 years of Polish independence. Uh, first day of our conference, someone uh, uh, someone uh, talk about uh, provocation as a tool for for uh, uh, for uh, being more attractive for for readers. This is this is a cover of this uh, of this uh, anniversary anniversary uh, issue. It seems like a screenshot of uh, of uh, video game you showed you shoot polish white eagles exactly like on polish uh, national flag your bullets are catholic crosses <laughs> of course it's, it's provocation but uh, in the uh, in the issue we we, we, we write about uh, education for a peace not for education not about education for a for a war thanks Thank you, Valdemar. Do you want to, um, I don't know if it's a possible endeavor for now, and if you want to do it, but uh, I wonder whether it would be worth, um, uh, because you've written this article, um, we can also do it uh, in, the, in the second round here uh, on the panel, mm -hmm. but uh, I would be very interested if you could briefly summarize a little bit how the Polish scene yeah. of cultural journals mm -hmm. uh, and this intellectual history actually mm -hmm. developed with just Kulturi mm -hmm. in it. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned a lot from this article, so I would, I would uh, think okay. it would be beneficial for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this article was a challenge for me because I am not a historian, I am not an expert uh, in, the, in the cultural journalism. For me, the simplest formula of cultural journalism is what is cultural journalism? Cultural journalists is what we doing. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's it's not so uh, it's not so smart, but very very simple. Okay, uh, breakthrough breakthrough year for the history of Poland and Europe, of course, and uh, for a cultural uh, cultural journal was uh, was uh, 89, 89. Earlier we have in socialist uh, states in Eastern Bloc. Earlier we had a censorship, party monopoly, and socialist market rules. And then came political freedom, liberalism, and free market. In the most popular narrative, this year uh, is a miracular year. Beginning of transformation and uh, opening of new order, or even, let's say, new world, new world in a term of economic, political, social. However, the reality is not one-dimensional and not, and not simple. New Order was a very good time in Poland for uh, uh, cultural journals without censorship, without total control, but it was also a very bad time. Uh, I have to I have to start by looking uh, into the past for for some important details. Uh, in eighty six in eighty six Poland has just uh, seventeen officially published socio cultural or cultural journals with prints run or less than uh, half million. This is low. This is low figures are linked uh, to the low level of trust low level of trust in the official media. Uh, in this context, the rising popularity of Catholic journals uh, in the 80s appears less surprising. The fact that the most popular of these, Tygodnik Powszechny or um, Universal Weekly, was published in a print runs of almost, uh, almost uh, 70,000 uh, copies in the time, and all sold seems uh, very credible. But in the one year after the beginning of transformation, uh, 51 new titles were published in Poland, 
in uh, 91, this figure rose to the 61, and in uh, 82 to 68. But in the first decade of the transition or the transformation, over 100 cultural journals also collapsed. Cultural journals opened, opened up new areas for uh, discussion, new areas for uh, thinking about culture, about independence. Uh, cultural journals proved to be particularly uh, important in terms of providing a wide, uh, a wide range of education resources. Many of them offered material about new thinking in uh, philosophy, in art, and especially in postmodernism. It was a very popular uh, trend in, uh, at the time. Editors, editors became recognized agents of the process of cultural modernization and transform homo sovieticus, passive, non-educational, into global men, global citizen, let's say. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, the German big four, I think Bertelsmann, Bauer, Springer, and Burda, built up their position very quickly in the market of, uh, of journal in Poland. But others, including JMS, Scandinavia, Egmont, and Helvetica, was also very successful. The game was transformed into a race to introduce new magazines into the market. Their formats and contents were very similar. Cultural journals did not fit, did not fit into this storyline, however, because their aim was not just to entertain and their production costs were not being reduced by copying imported formats. That's why I think that the 81 and the transformation was a great time golden era for uh, cultural journals in Poland, but also bad time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Waldemar, um, Morten, you have the, uh, the daunting task <laughs> to, <laughs> to give us a little uh, input here and there. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this to you okay. where you want to uh, maybe um, yeah, say say a bit more on um, on from from a historic uh, perspective of uh, intellectual history. One one can look at these uh, these uh, cases and these histories. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot, and uh, also thanks for the honor to be able to speak uh, on a panel with editors of such great magazines. Um, so I'm not going to try to connect all the dots. I think we can do this in the discussion. Rather, um, I want to give a bit of a um, insight into what was our thinking when founding the working group of periodical studies and how this relates to the questions discussed yesterday and today. So just yesterday uh, in the afternoon, my colleague Moritz, with whom I wrote this article on right-wing journals, um, reminded me of a quite intriguing letter the ph philosopher uh, Walter Benjamin sent to his friend, the communist poet and play uh, playwright Bertolt Brecht in 19, I think 29 or 30, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe a lot of you know this letter, actually. Uh, in this letter, Benjamin gave a detailed description of a plan that Brecht and he were developing uh, to produce a journal. Uh, this journal was to be titled Krise und Kritik, so Crisis and Critique. And in this uh, letter, there's a very intriguing sentence. Um, Benjamin wrote to Brecht, the aim of the journal is to identify or bring about the crisis by means of critique. So from the letter exchange, but also from other writings of Benjamin at the time, we can gather that the crisis that Benjamin had in mind was the crisis of bourgeois uh, society or bourgeois culture. Now, that might not be the goal of all uh, journal editors to bring about this crisis. Um, and in any case, it's quite a lofty ambition, I think, uh, to produce a journal that can bring about such a crisis. In any case, this journal never saw the light of the day, and in 1933, as all of you know, the National Socialists gained power in Germany. 
Yet I think, and that's why I, I'm quite intrigued by this letter, the exchange between Benjamin and Brecht points to the fact that also Roma mentioned at his, uh, in his introduction, that journals are not merely a vessel for content or a kind of sign of the times, but rather that they are a vital organ in their own right, with a proper and specific construction, with their own materiality, and with their own specific effects. And also with their own historicity, by which I mean that they have a history, that they are within history, and that they also make history. And I think this observation is what lays at the heart of the working group for period periodical studies, which we together founded in, I think, 2017 it was, in Berlin. Since then, this group met two times in real life. It also has a mailing list and so on. The working group, I remember when we first started to talk about the idea of forming such a working group at a conference, uh, where there was Roman and other people um, that are now part of the group. The starting point of this working group was our impression that in all areas of the humanities and social sciences, there was a renewed interest in the journal as a form. So um, it was an interest that did not regard journals as merely historical sources or reference points or symptoms but that considered them as social, cultural, political, and also aesthetic actors in their own right. Since then, so since 2017, roughly 50 people have joined the research group, which kind of proved our first impression that there was quite an interest in the humanities going on with journals. At the same time, this interest, at least with me, and maybe this would be something to debate, spurred the suspicion that this renewed interest in journals as a form and as historical objects is also a symptom, a symptom for change. Um, I guess it has to do with the, and this is something that we discussed yesterday, and I guess you discussed at meetings before that uh, again and again, it has to do with the huge transformation of culture as printing culture, as it was in the past, through, on the one hand, the digital revolution, but on the other hand, through the neoliberal reorganization of society, which I guess you could say ushered in a crisis of the cultural journal, or at least a crisis of their role and function, leading to a reevaluation re of things we long thought to be self-explanatory or even self-evident or obvious. So things that seem to us as being normal are now up for consideration again. I think one of such self-evident things, for example, might be the idea that cultural journals played a central role for the creation, for the sustainability, and also for the democratization of the public sphere after 1945 and in the former Soviet Union after 1990. And I think it, this is a story that the contribution by Waldemar in, that he gave now, but also in his article complicates already quite a lot. Almost all studies on journals up until now were dedicated, at least studies on journals after 1945, were dedicated to journals that are broadly at least positioned on the left or liberal side of the political spectrum. Yet one of the common char characteristics when right now speaking about the current rise of the new or alt-right, at least in Germany, is the prominence of journal journals within this movement. So this was the starting point for me and Moritz to set out to investigate the history of right-wing magazines in the post-war period up until now. This is the article that Roman mentioned at the beginning, which was published today. Sorry, Simon, for giving you such a hard time uh, with copy editing it. Um, and thanks a lot for making it possible to be online today. Um, well, in the course of this piece, um, we like, it was also like a discovery for us, because as Roman said, it's like a kind of foreign world for many of us, this, this area of right-wing uh, studies, uh, right-wing journals and so on. And I don't want to spoil too much of this text, um, but I want to point towards two findings that we made, which I think might be quite interesting for our discussion today. So the first point, um, or the first finding we made is that a certain type of magazine, which in academia is generally referred to as little magazine, 
most of you probably know this term, so that is magazines with a higher programmatic approach, with a limited audience, and which in the past were often understood as important instruments for the development of the European avant-garde and neon avant-garde, were of central importance for the survival of networks of national socialist politicians, thinkers, and journalists in the post-war period up until the 70s or maybe even up until the 80s. While parties and political groups were regularly forbidden in the wake of the Second World War, the more low-level organizational form of the journal allowed for a long liberty, which later on could be translated into more sustained political projects with the emergence of new right-wing parties in the 60s and 80s which weren't forbidden. So this is, I think, quite an interesting point of what magazines also can do, and it actually links quite interestingly to the point that you made about the generational transfer that is enacted via magazines and how it actually is played out. The second finding that I want to um, mention here, and which might be closely connected, but that's up to debate, to the first one is that right-wing magazines right now are thriving. Um, they are increasing their print runs, there's new right-wing magazines uh, um, springing up everywhere, and um, we believe, at least, or one idea that we had is why, why that is so, why, why they are thriving right now is that it has to do with their acute awareness of the role and function which they have within the current media and political landscape. It has to do with their alliance to movements on the streets and in the parliaments, and more specifically, I think, with their understandings of the mechanisms and workings of a refractured media space. So, Coming back to like a more general point, if the study of journals has a merit for journal making as well, it might be that it helps us to better understand their specific effects and roles in the past, their progressive potentials, but maybe also their limitations and the exclusions that they themselves enacted. You already mentioned that a certain type of journal can also form exclusiveness and so on, which might be a problem or might be at service of something. And this, this understanding of uh, their specificity in the past might allow, allow also for a more accurate understanding of their change position and potential today. In consequence, I think, and I already tried to make this clear yesterday, I think that means that we shouldn't get nostalgic about the bygone era of liberal civil society, the welfare state, and democratic public, because they don't exist anymore in this sense or simply continue business as usual. Maybe it would rather mean to radicalize one's own critique and rethink the formats and pro production of journals accordingly. And to mention maybe two successful left-wing attempts at doing so, two recent uh, left-wing examples of doing so, which are both outside of the EuroZ network, not to step on anybody's toes here, I would mention first of all, and probably of little surprise to all of you, the Jacobin magazine on the one hand, on the other hand, the, at least I think in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, very well-known blog journal, Geschichte der Gegenwart, so history of the present. And I think what makes them successful is the extreme sensitivity to their concrete context, so to the, to the context in which they act. That also means, I think that's an important lesson at least that I took away from it, is that they are not simply translatable into other contexts. So I think a German Jacobin is doomed to fail as much as an American history of the present, at least if you just translate directly the, the formats. This brings me to my last point. Um, so, I'm not sure if uh, today the critique advanced, or enacted rather, by cultural journals should be a critique that brings about the crisis as Walter Benjamin thought about, or if we need to take more into consider in consideration the dangers that that would entail, or if it is simply an overestimation of the possibilities of critique by men who really loved letters quite a lot. Yeah. But I think at least we should discuss this. Thank you. Th thank you, Morten. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, also from this, I will just retain uh, two ideas I've, I've heard now um, to, uh, because uh, what we're trying to do here is to build something like a little archive of, of, the, of the general function ourselves, right? Of aspects of, 
what one can learn from c how journals function in concrete, uh, precise situations and, and what maybe from there can be generalized for something like journal history. Um, what you too have been pinpointing is the role of cultural journals in moments of transformation and of crisis. Um, whether uh, as uh, Benjamin and Brecht sought to advance, like uh, um, bring the crisis about, or whether it is just uh, trying to, to reflect, to coming to terms, to provide new ideas in moments of, of cultural transformations with always the risk of then other players moving in and taking over and maybe sidelining uh, those agents who, who have uh, um, put forward the ideas in the first place. But this is a, uh, to me also, this is a crucial, uh, crucial aspect of cultural journals is their relation to, um, to, to, to societal transformation and crisis g going on. And this is also why the context sensitivity is so important uh, and why you cannot simply take one editorial model. I mean, how many times has it been tried to bring the New York Review of Books to Europe um, in, in the past? And it's always this, this I idea of um, uh, somehow transferring the successful model that is, is, has been successful um, in a very specific context uh, to, to another context and, and to somehow tweak it here and there and then hope that it, it, it'll work. And as most journal historians will probably uh, agree, um, it never works, right? There are very few cases where, where this can work. So there seems to be something peculiar about cultural journals that is um, very closely linked to the context, the local or the, or the political context in which they are made. And this is a huge problem for a transnational network like we are here or European journal or European endeavor um, because of this, um, um, yeah, this, this task of um, how, how can you go from scale up, go from there to, to uh, more diverse and broader uh, publics. Okay, I think this is uh, all for us uh, from now from, from the panel. We have uh, 30 minutes left. I think this is a good time uh, for everybody to, to, uh, to join the conversation and uh, maybe enrich this, uh, this, uh, this archive of uh, the culture form. Is there anybody adventurous enough to make a start? Yep. <coughs> I don't know how much this would be relevant, but actually um, uh, it's a direct reference to Charles Kultur and the way you started and uh, reference to the name of yours in. Zines were, uh, in the 80s and the 90s, were a big type of, uh, a big format for um, <clears throat> starting a journal or starting at least some type of publication that comes from a milieu which is, uh, you know, grassroots bringing up. And I was wondering now what that format would be now, because we are now in the, in the um, company of established journals, more or less, of um, a, an old form. And um, um, I, while you were talking, I was thinking what the new format of Samizdat would be now, which is not print. And I was actually thinking about YouTubers which are now, uh, I think, uh, the place where the new ideas are uh, at least disseminated, if not created. And I, I know that this can sound as blasphemy, uh, <clears throat> comparing YouTubers to uh, intellectual elites of the cultural journalists, but I think that is the, that's, that's actually the underground space where, the, where at least the new formats are, are discussed and especially when we talk about alt-right, but also when we talk about, um, uh, uh, when we talk about new left ideas. Uh, so uh, this is off the mainstream. I was wondering um, if we can um, uh, think about that space um, in addition to the digitalization of, of, um, of, the, of journals and of the print journals, if we can think of that space also as an addition or at least as a resource to tap into when discussing ideas um, and when discussing the digital age. In, I mean, we are all online, most of us are online. 
whether we we'll link to others or not, it's a different question, but we still live in the virtual um, uh, space. So yeah, I would like a comment on that if, if you have any. Thank you for, um, uh, thank you for your suggestions. Uh, I think it is very important. Uh, what I say now, uh, what I would to say, uh, Chas Culture is not a mm, business project. It is still a social project. Maybe, maybe direction to, to new media, new digital media like, uh, like uh, YouTube is a good direction, but in Poland, the most popular channel on, uh, on YouTube are uh, populist, nationalist, and xenophobic channels. It's a uh, uh, post-socialist in post-digital era. <laughs> Is the, it's, it's real now. Maybe it's a challenge to, to journals like, like Chas Kultury uh, conquest this, this new area. Yeah, maybe. Maybe just a little comment on that because um, I, I also think this is a very interesting phenomenon. And when we started to write this article, like one of our, our primary questions was why does the alt-right or the new right have such a high regard for tradi traditional journals when they mainly act in the different media sphere? And what we like, found out is that the links are very important. The, the way that I think they're really, really acutely aware of how the different media formats work and what they need from each other. And uh, so, for example, uh, there was a real crisis with the Junge Freiheit, which is a, a weekly newspaper, when it lost due to a fight with the editor its intellectual journal, which was like kind of linked to, to the weekly paper, and they had to found a new one to have also this area of like advancing ideas and so on. And so I think it's really interesting to think about how these different areas can be, can be connected and what role actually traditional journals can play in this environment which, which can not just be like kind of sucked into the new sphere. I just want to say something very briefly. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting, um, mainly online, but also print journal in Britain called Galdem. I don't know if people have heard of it. It's, um, uh, it's uh, women of color uh, producing their own journal for, you know, to give themselves a voice. So in terms of new voices, it's quite an interesting model because they started off online with online articles and blogs, but they now have a print, print edition. And really interestingly, in August, the Guardian newspaper, um, it has a, a magazine a weekend supplement. They gave that to Al Galdem to curate. And so I just think it's quite interesting that actually people do want to be in print, but what online, it's partly it's like an e ecology, so that you know the different types of media feed into each other. So you can have the situation where new voices are enabled to enter into this more traditional area by the fact they can start off online. You know, so I think that's a really good thing. I recommend that to people to look at. <laughs> Galdem, it's I called. I think we, we have understood that. Yeah. We're all going to, once we have internet again upstairs, we're all going to yeah. Google it. Um, yeah, the, the ecosystem question, of course, the, the role of how, how different formats play into each other. And uh, for, for cultural journals, of course, this poses the question of finding uh, an appropriate, uh, a specific editorial form that would then work uh, as well as the, the traditional journal form uh, on paper uh, for worked for, for cultural journals in the past. And as I have said in the, in the short introductory remarks, that is, of course, uh, the result of a long learning process of um, how, um, how a journal could uh, um, do something that, for example, a book cannot do. And, um, you know, uh, the, the, the proximity of other genres, uh, of course, I mean, we, I, I was fascinated by this, uh, this study um, you mentioned where exposure of 20 seconds, who, who, where was this? Who, who, who said it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, how this primes your reception of what comes afterwards. Of course, this is also true for cultural journals. Uh, you cannot evaluate a, 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 an article published in a journal solely 
on the basis of the article and its contents, but you have to look at the ensemble. I mean, as editors, you all know that this is your daily work of um, conceiving a, a journal as an ensemble that consists of different genres. What do you position next to what? You get an article in that you don't agree with, but you think it's important. You will cushion it in a way in between other articles. I mean, this is the daily work of editors. And, and of course, this works in an entirely different way in the digital sphere. Um, people tend to look at, to search and find single articles uh, and do not look at the environment in which the, they were published. By the way, there have been crises like this. Uh, I have worked, I've written a book on Lettre Internationale. The German Lettre Internationale has once published an interview uh, with Fidel Castro. Uh, which was in a dossier, publishing this interview in a dossier had a completely different meaning from publishing an interview with Fidel Castro as such. Um, media reception has been solely on this uh, interview with Fidel Castro. There's been a second case which, uh, like this uh, more recently in the past. Anyways, um, of course, this is, this is a crucial point for for, for journals and for, for journal editors to think about the possible transformation of the strength of the, of the journal form, which is very linked to the print Gutenberg Galaxis, and how this may be translated into a new uh, ecosystem. George. I wanted to ask Morton uh, a question. I, I feel sort of shamefully ignorant about far-right journals, and, and probably m many of us are. Uh, but from what you've described, and especially the idea of links, um, they really, you're describing a kind of uh, almost semi-military <laughs> gathering of forces, very much in co sort of uh, consistent with Benjamin's idea of, of creating the crisis. Um, what I want to know from you, if you could talk briefly, is uh, is there anything on the left uh, that parallels that sort of, rather than uh, talking about larger issues like ecology and so on, but uh, left journals that are really rallying people around towards, uh, for political action, either in the US or in, in, in uh, Europe? I can't think of them. Maybe just briefly, like, I think actually, as I mentioned, Jacobin is an attempt at doing so in a certain context, in a, in a context where there was no socialist left visible in the United States. So this is like an, an example. There's problems with this as well, as well, and that's what I think for me is more important. I think it's actually dangerous to, I think your description is totally right of, of the far right publishing sphere as like a kind of dedicated political project getting in line. And I think actually this is not something, at least in my opinion, that we should try to mimic because that actually suspends critical dialogue, this suspends uh, the complexity, the, the dealings with complexities uh, of the world and so on. But still then there is the question, what else do we do? So, but I think that would, that would be important for, for me to say, even though it seems quite successful right now what they're doing, I think that's not the model that we should try to mimic, but it's worthy to think about what they're doing and why they're successful. And that's a point that we made very strongly in our article is to say they are not successful on their own. They need the movements in the streets, they need the parties, and you can see always a spike in the relevance of right-wing journals once such a movement appears. Even though they consider themselves as an avant-garde and as an elite and so on, there would be nothing without the people torching uh, refugee houses and, and people in the parliament saying this is good. So this is also a question of ecology, I think. And probably that means left-wing journals, it's, whatever they try to attempt, it's hard for left-wing journals if there's not a left-wing current <laughs> in politics and in the world. It's interesting in the British case where such a current exists right now and it seems that it leads to a renewed interest also in theoretical debates and so on. If you, I mean, you mentioned Monument yesterday when we talked about, uh, about the situation, but also if you think of platforms like Novara Media, which is online, which has like formats of video and text and so on. So yeah, basically that. <laughs> 
There had been a, a question there, and I have a question for uh, Marit um, from Urok Bild. You didn't mention that uh, in last year's anniversary edition, uh, all the articles were written by women. Um, yeah. So, um, could you? S what was the reason for that? Uh, was yeah. it to bring about a crisis in pat patriarchy, or what was it in the context of history writing about uh, journals that made you uh, decide for, for that? Yeah, it was. I think it was maybe a way of pointing to the future. Uh, I mean, um, instead of uh, looking backwards, looking back, um, because historically, um, uh, well, the history of order build has been dominated by male editors and writers, even though there has been female writers um, and editors quite early. And I think also that um, you know the people I mean the founder Carl Wolin he was an editor for 45 years but he had uh, like um, co-work co-editors who were women so I think and that's also something that is um, I just want to say this that uh, whenever you you have like um, preconception of of an era in order builds history when you look closer it's more complex and so even this is more complex it's not like they were all men making order build up until now, but uh, but we didn't. Um, yeah, we decided to um, uh, ask uh, very good writers, and yes, they are all women. And uh, so it's uh, it's a way of like um, it's kind of a vision for the future, maybe. Uh, yeah. So there are no men in the future. <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, well, it's just uh, a little. Uh, you know, bit of counterbalance the mm -hmm. history, yeah. Andrea, say that more. The, the mic, what is it? Maybe, I think we are streaming this too, so it would be good if, uh, yeah. Uh, my question would not be so much the political history, it's uh, basically a, a question to uh, Roman and, and, and Morton, but the, the notion, the uh, cultural journal, uh, mm and the German notion, Literaturzeitschrift, so the literary magazine. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, ask you to develop a little bit about how you, so to say, in integrate the uh, question of aesthetics in your research. Because I think it was quite uh, uh, astonishing when uh, Marit uh, uh, gave her example what translates easily and what transfers from one generation to the other is art. So it, it's, it, I think it has, it, it comes not without reason that the uh, example you took was Selma Lagerlöf to LNK and then to this new approach with this Instagram project to, to make this uh, walk and then try to find a new aesthetic uh, form for that also. also. So uh, this, uh, if you could develop a little bit more on that, I would be very happy. Morten? Uh. <laughs> um. I think, uh, um, I mean, we, we could have dis we, we didn't have the time yesterday when we discussed the study uh, on the question of, of the the problematic as the definition problem of cult Kulturzeitschrift, cultural journal, and whatever. Um, French we have revue, which seems to say everything in one word uh, in in a, in a certain way. Um, I think the. Um, uh, if you ask me, I think the, the, there's a better term for, for the kind of journals that is uh, predominant also in Eurozine than, than Kulturzeitschrift, and that would be politisch-literarische Zeitschrift in German. That would mean political literary journal. Um, just saying that there seems to be a constitutional uh, tension at the core of that kind of journal between um, the political and, but then not only the literary, but the, the, the art, the aesthetical, um, th that kind of question. And, and um, so they are um, a Kulturzeitschrift, and, and Kulturzeitschrift or cultural journals then, I think is a somewhat awkward placeholder term um, that no one is extremely happy with, or, um, but that just um, came to represent uh, 
the, the genre in, in, in a certain way. And of course, it makes things very difficult because uh, if you say uh, Kultur uh, in, in German, do you mean the arts or do you mean mm, Kultur as in Humboldt or the cultural, if you say cultural studies in a German sense that comes from philolo philologies, it is it something very different from the cultural studies in the British sense. So um, I don't think we, we are uh, going to, to resolve this, this problem, but um, nonetheless, I think um, for me at the core is um, um, not, uh, not culture in the sense of the arts, not really culture as a whole way of life either in, in the sense of cultural studies, but uh, something um, uh, that would be, um, yeah, what, what was f uh, in the post-war era uh, understood under the uh, engagement title, this, this battle between the autonomy of the arts and, and culture and cultural production and the need to link it to societal issues and, and political transformations. Um, and uh, it's not a political, it, we are not talking about purely political journals either, and this has to do with the aesthetical aspect and with the, and, and with the cultural production being at the core of uh, the selection process that goes on in cultural journals as well. No. Mm. Would. I mean, just briefly picking up on the, on the question of aesthetics from a research perspective, I think what's interesting is that the, the giants we are dealing with have their own aesthetic as objects, as, as printed uh, matter, um, and they deal with questions of aesthetics. So there, there's, there's a double self-reflexivity in a certain way, I would say, in almost all of those journals, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so they reflect on their own form by talking about aesthetics, but by also enacting a certain form of aesthetics um, through the journal. And what I think we in all our meetings always discuss is, and this is very closely linked to the question of the digital archive, is when we research uh, magazines, what are the aspects that we should look at? Can we look at like just the most important texts? Roman already made a strong commitment to say, no, we can't look at isolated important texts. We need to look at the whole printed matter which, as you can imagine, once digitalization of archives kicks in, becomes difficult. So I think these are very pertinent questions with, which, uh, yeah, I think is very important to keep in mind when thinking about journals. And I see two. Hi, Andreas uh, Engström. Uh, Positionen in, uh, in Berlin, that's uh, uh, about contemporary music. Um, I'm Swedish, uh, Scandinavian, so I'm, I don't really have a question. Uh, it's more uh, a thought uh, which might seem a little bit naive because I think that this, this discussion about the problematic of defining a culture journal is for me completely irrelevant and, uh, and not a problem at all. Of course, you could uh, div divide between culture journal and literary journal the way, the way you just mm -hmm. did. Uh, but I... Um, uh, in, in the Scandinavian context, this is not really a problem. And, it's all, and I was also surprised to hear yesterday the mentioning of uh, minority journals, how to or if they should be included or approached by using. And, for, and uh, I don't understand is why this is even a question. Uh, aren't they already? Or, but uh, but uh, they are not here. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, are, they are not here. And uh, isn't this uh, just part of... I would e wouldn't even like to call it minority. Uh, it, if they're a literary journal or a music journal and they are made by a minority community or in another langu language, it's, uh, it's just a culture journal. Um, I would also like to ask you Germans and maybe other Germans as well. When I looked at the Tamara's uh, chart yesterday on, uh, on the culture journals, the Scandinavians seem fine. I mean, many, many are there. Um, well, I think most. Um, when I say the German, it looks like just ridiculous to me. You have 69 journals in, uh, in Germany, and I could immediately see that there are eight, um, three major, so to say, and five minor contemporary music journals, and they are not there. There are a couple of um, major theater uh, journals, they are not there. 
And uh, of course, these 69 could very well uh, be a good representation of how a, a culture journal works. But, uh, um, but uh, my question is uh, if this, is even, this chart is even relevant as a subject of study for culture journal in the major, uh, the biggest, uh, the largest European Union country. But I would like to ask you Germans and maybe some other Germans here, what do you think, what was your reaction? Have you seen this chart and what, um, what, 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 what are your ideas about uh, culture journals when you look at these 69 names and the question of uh, minority journals? I, I have another idea because Tamara has raised her hand <laughs> and so I would uh, try to escape to answer your question by passing on the mic. Uh, but your comment, but your comment was extremely important. Uh, we perceive ourselves as a liberal, leftist, and open society. But what about minorities, ethnic minorities, for example? Yes, it's of extremely important. Um, so yeah, it's a matter of it. Thank you, first of all, for that comment. Um, the main empirical researcher was German and did a lot of work actually in German with German colleagues to get to this list. And we were surprised as well. So I'm really happy. And, and as I said yesterday, please give us the names that you are missing there. It is not our intention to say this is it. And actually, it's a starting point. So please, if you can give us these, these references, that would be really good. Um, there was a very specific discussion or um, when in the case of Germany, indeed, because Kulturzeitschrift is a very different term than cultural journals as, it, um, as the English term doesn't translate easily. So we found it really difficult. It, it was interesting. How do you translate it and what comes up then? And indeed, a number of journals that were included by other countries were not included there. So we used not only web scrapers, but also a lot of the governmental databases, so where they were where they were there, and then you come to translation issues because then who decides what is what is in and what is out so for all countries, if you have knowledge um, uh, about things that are missing, please either let Eurozine or let us know the details are um, for contact details are there as well so but it does raise a, a, a broader issue, um, I raise my hand to ask another question, but um, it does raise a, this broader issue indeed. How do we define it and, and does it matter? And, and perhaps the, the case is different in, in Scandinavia, as you say, um, it's not even an issue. Uh, ethnic minority um, uh, journals are included or voices are included. Uh, that is not the case for, for all countries. Um, and, I, and I do, uh, Agree that it's something that maybe Eurozine or in this network, this this um, group of people can can look into. For me, the question, and it also comes back to the first question around YouTube. For me, the question that is actually uh, when you presented the panel in the in the program is, w which really got me thinking. So, um, the how the cultural form. Of, of journals, sort of, so what we found in our studies that essay, the essay is mm. the most, um, most used form. It's almost used by, I think it was 88% of the, of the journals. And in, in the introduction of the panel, it says, well, uh, cultural journals have performed a really important role in shaping how we think, how we argue, how we um, talk about issues in societies, and I, and I think actually that is really true because it is a cultural elite that indeed is shaping and not just representing what is going on in society. And I, I wanted to ask uh, uh, the panel or maybe others here, um, to what extent do we need to also shake things up in terms of form? I mean, we, I'm mean, an academic and we ask our students to write essays. And I'm very well aware that that put students in a very particular direction in the way in which they think about things, in the way in which they write about things, um, what is deemed as reasonable and logical. Mm. And, and, and I couldn't help but wonder, when you talk about YouTube, is there, is there a new form coming up? Does that, is that shaping in a similar way or in a different way, the way in which we argue and narrate and, and, and make our, our society? 
it's a very broad question, but I would really like mm. um, input on that and any any input that people have. I think re with regard to the time we've left, we uh, I would just like to collect and then we, we have a final comment. Um, yes. And there was a question here, and I think that will have to be it from the side of the thank questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah. My name is Simona. I was born in Slovenia and I lived for 30 years in uh, Barcelona, so I am like a... Uh, one body and two souls, and they have a lot of, of uh, experience in the field of languages and translating. I'm also with Ola at the Pen International as a chair of Translation and Linguistic Rights Committee. So I will speak a little bit, try to, to comment on the qu issue of, of languages, smaller languages, minority issues and all that. I have to say I was uh, yesterday almost shocked with your uh, uh, report, Tamara, because the question of languages of these journals was absolutely not taken into account. So in Spain, for example, well, but in your summary, uh, in your summary, uh, you just spoken about, I don't know, 50 uh, different journals in Spain, which for me is like saying, what are we doing? Uh, all the history if there is no possibility to make Europeans aware that there are several languages in Spain and they are not minority uh, languages. There are huge cultural traditions behind of that and we are sitting here in Europe and we are not aware of that. And when I compare that with my last trips uh, with Penn International into India or into, I just last year, I made a uh, report for UNESCO about publishing industry in minority languages in Africa. Uh, and we are moving forward to go to, I don't know, to Chiapas next year uh, to speak with Maya people and tell them how to do publishing industry in their languages and their oral tradition. They are really big repression against them. But we are here and we are not able to put this question of languages, which culture is part of it, uh, into the, one of the central themes. So I just, I'm sorry to be like, a bit, a, a bit provocative, but I believe that for Europe, uh, really translation is the language of Europe, like uh, Umberto Eco once said, and this is for, for a network like uh, Eurozine, just fundamental. Thank you. Mm. We have one remark from, from Philip, one short comment directly, yeah. If I just may for one second. Um, I think we have to be careful to distingu distinguish between, and that's something that we have reflected also in Eurozine over the past months when we did the study, to distinguish between the definition of journal that was used for the study and uh, kind of our internal, uh, the, the way we perceive cultural journals in, in Eurozine, and then again the, the, the selection of, uh, of, uh, of journals for the network. So these are different things, and there's a good reason why we uh, commissioned the study to a university and uh, you know, and, and, and left them, left these questions to them. Mm. And uh, to to get back to what you said, Andreas, uh, it uh, Eurozine uh, is uh, the way I see it, and I think uh, uh, my colleagues will 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 confirm that it's a very open open network, uh, open to applications from any kind of uh, cultural journal, and uh, as long as they are, for example, independent from. Uh, political parties, for example, things like that. Uh, when they're independent um, and interested, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, invited to apply, uh, including Positionen, for example. Uh, so there is a great openness, but uh, there is also, I think, uh, an observation that uh, something that uh, didn't come up uh, that much today, uh, the more kind of generalist uh, approach uh, uh, versus the more kind of more specialist or also more political journals that, that are there. And uh, my impression is that um, that, uh, uh, that uh, there is kind of a natural reason why many of the journals that are represented in Eurozine have, have, have either a more generalist approach or if they focus on, on literature, they are also interested in, in other areas. Um, I think uh, that, that, uh, that, that these journals will, will seek you know, more kind of an uh, exchange with, with, with other areas. Uh, so, so, so there's kind of a, a natural reason, uh, I guess, for that. But this being said, again, so uh, um, absolutely there's no, there, it's out of question that uh, 
specialist and uh, music journals and uh, minority journals. Uh, we haven't received any applications over the past uh, years from, from, from something that you're calling minority journals. So, so uh, if you know any, please invite them to our conferences. Uh, we are very uh, active in that uh, regard. We have, for example, invited all cultural journals in the broadest sense from Austria to this conference. So they were all invited by name, uh, and some of them showed up. Uh, not as many as I had hoped for, but uh, so, so that's very important uh, for me, and thanks for listening. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, just to, to respond quickly also uh, to, to this point, I think, uh, well, uh, Philip already mentioned it. We have, of course, we have to be careful about on what level we are talking. Are we talking uh, in that case, we are talking about um, how to define a term in order to get a quantitative <coughs> study. And um, I, I understand that this is a different question of definitions can be boring uh, or, or a nuisance, but of course um, the, we cannot, or at least if we want to, to, to do something like a survey of a European field, we cannot escape that question to, to arrive at the definition that then works uh, for, for to, to, to include or exclude empirical data. I mean, this is a very, uh, I don't think most of people here, including myself, have uh, a, a tendency to love uh, that kind of empirical approach, but no, it is... L-O-V-E, to love. <laughs> <laughs> to L -O -V -E, to love. Um, but... Um, uh, it is, of course, a necessity, and, and the idea here was that, I mean, our working group is uh, more historically, um, has a more historical approach, a more qualitative approach. There are people working in media and communication studies who need uh, a, a little bit uh, of a more restrict uh, definition in order to, 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 to get at data, but that doesn't mean that... Um, uh, that is uh, no prejudice for for whatever journal uh, will be will be uh, in in Eurozine. Um, so I think we we discuss on several levels here, and we have competing demands, and sometimes uh, they can be very um, one can be very unhappy with the results, um, because of course if you see that there are I don't know one thousand two hundred journals in France uh, compared to six sixty in in Germany that's obviously not true right <laughs> so here's obviously a federation of cultural journals in France that defines the term very differently from how w uh, the Germans would uh, conceive the term of cult uh, Kultur Zeitschrift. We have to, this is a starting point, and now we have to continue to discuss to arrive at something that is actually a workable uh, discussion to, to con continue on the scientific path. And, and, and for a network, it's, uh, it's maybe not so important because um, there's a very good day-to-day -day understanding of what journal fits in and, and, and what doesn't. Um, so I don't think one has to fetishize this, uh, but it's good to spend an hour and a half on a Eurozine conference uh, on, on, on that question, and that can be it. In so uh, in that sense, uh, this is it. Um, we now have lunch, and we can all continue. And there's an announcement from, from the organizers, I think, um, from my side, thank you very much for, for this discussion and, uh, and your presence on a Sunday morning. Thank you.